Hey everybody, welcome to another dining room recorded lecture. It is now day 41 on the quarantine count up and as you can see I've switched to a different method of counting because I hit 40 days and ran out of space. Didn't want to take up more real estate on the board. It's now a biblical floods worth of days of rain and nights of rain. We've moved on to the second phase. So here we are. Uh, end of week four, also the end of part one of the class where we're looking at the liberal family of ideas. Uh, starting next week, we're going to be looking at the critics uh, that are promised in the title of the course. So uh, that's going to be a, a nice big shift that's coming up. Um, today's class is about liberal internationalism. And liberal internationalism is a different member of the liberal family of ideas in a couple ways. One, it's a relatively new set of ideas, uh, really 20th century in vintage. And also, it is a, a sort of double up version of what liberalism is. It's both a normative, I don't like that piece of chalk, and rewrite that. Oh yeah, that's bad chalk, I gotta get new chalk. It's both normative and explanatory. And the difference between normative and explanatory is that normative is about how things should be, and explanatory is about how things are. And up to this point, what we have been dealing with in terms of the liberal family ideas is primarily the normative side. Uh, it was born as a, this is the way the world should be. Now, one of the things about any normative theory, it elevates a certain value or set of values and makes value propositions, and of course argues for those value propositions. Um, and part of the argument for those value propositions is a value type of argument, a normative style of argument, right? That this value is better than the other value. Another part, and usually the two go hand in hand, is an explanatory aspect, which is uh, backing up the value argument, and sometimes it's actually the, the crux of the value argument. The world is this way, and we should be in alignment with the way the world is, so we should follow these precepts. Uh, that is a pretty standard form of normative argument. It's not the only form. Uh, you, can, you can argue for value propositions in terms of uh, value arguments, in terms of metaphysical claims, in terms of uh, a set of kind of cultural, uh, um, uh, what is it, cultural, shared cultural values, uh, cultural assumptions. Uh, so it's not the only way, but it is definitely a powerful and common way. And, and a lot of our liberal thinkers have done just that. They've, they've mixed uh, an explanatory and a normative style in order to uh, assert value propositions. Right. Mill, for example, uh, was arguing that you know, humans make choices to uh, um, maximize their interests, maximize their, their greater good. That's sort of part of our instrumental rationality. That's how we've evolved. He didn't talk about evolution, of course, because he was you know, living around the same time Darwin was, but uh, his, the idea was that this is what we're like. And nature, God, evolution, whatever it is, has, has created us as these sort of uh, uh, benefit-seeking, pro-con-weighing types of beings. And for Mill, then, what we should do is when we're talking about humans in a society, we should generalize the way we are to the way the society should be. So that's, that's an example of a form of normative argument that borrows from the explanatory. Um, you could also argue and just say, you know, liberty is a superior value to other values because, etc. Uh, because it's just the, it's, you know, that's, that is, it's superior because it takes into account the, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? It takes into account the uh, rational, sovereign nature of individuals, not that we need to generalize or, or from individual behavior to societal behavior, but that we, that, that's, we are sovereign, rational individuals, and that concept is in itself inherently valuable. So that's sort of more of a metaphysical, a normative argument that's purely resting on other, other normative claims. I don't want to go too much into this. It's not terribly important. I think that you probably get the idea of this distinction. One of the reasons I bring up this distinction is because liberal internationalism itself is both a normative and an explanatory theory kind of separately. Like there are liberal internationalists who are primarily 
political analysts who are looking at the international system and they're trying to explain it. And then there are other liberal internationalists who are making a normative claim that the, that the international system should be like this. And they are going to be making uh, an argument very much that's built on the, uh, it should be this way because of certain facts about the world. Um, it's also the case that liberal internationalism is both of these things sort of separately and then there's a mixture of it, uh, but that the primary idea, the primary political viewpoint that liberal internationalism is responding to, reacting against, arguing against, is itself uh, both normative and explanatory style. And, and uh, the political perspective, the ideology, the theory, whatever you want to call it, that liberal internationalism is uh, a reaction against, a critique of, is realism. And this is realism in a kind of a, a specific sense. If any of you have taken the class in international relations or comparative politics uh, or in any kind of anything that has to do with international uh, affairs or international uh, activities, you will run, I'm sure, run into the concept of realism. Realism in this context is the uh, theory, the explanatory theory, that the international system is an anarchic system of competing nation states. So, what is the system? Anarchic competition among nation states. What it essentially is, is the state of nature where the players, the actors, are nation states. There are no rules. It's anarchic in that sense, not the sense that it's chaotic, right? but in the sense that there are no rules. There's no global government, there's no international uh, institutions that uh, are capable of enforcing rules. Uh, so the international system, unlike national systems, nation states have rules and power and uh, enforcement regimes. The international system does not have those. So that's what it is. It, 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 it can't be anything else, since there is no overarching power. And the, then the normative side, the should, is that nation states should behave with this in mind and act to maximize their national power as the only avenue towards security. So what states should do is maximize power. And what maximizing power provides you is peace and prosperity. And then, realism in the explanatory side of things, and I'm not going to diagram it all out because this is not fundamentally a class about realism, it's not fundamentally a class about international relations, um, but the realists say, well, you know, when we see peace and prosperity, and when we actually get both of these together and we have stability, when there's stability in the international system, it's not because there's any kind of cooperation. It's not because there's any kind of international regime that's, in, that's capable of enforcing uh, uh, norms and behaviors that lead to peace, prosperity, and add up to stability. <clears throat> it's that the actions of nation states competing with each other and seeking to maximize power, um, it creates a certain kind of balance. And that balance can occur in a variety of ways. But the idea is, is that, the, that if you put these two things together, this is what the international system is. If nation states actually, if, if the leaders of nation states actually embrace this should, um, then what we're going to get is we're going to get a balance of power. But the balance of power is always shifting. Nation states, because it's an anarchic system, they're always uh, competing and they're seeking to maximize power, and things will get unbalanced. And when there is war, and when uh, there is economic destruction, and when there's instability, uh, these are a result of the balance of power being out of, uh, out of whack. And the most realists would say that the system itself has a tendency to move towards uh, some kind of equilibrium in the balance of power, but that that's a long-term tendency and that in the short term there are going to be uh, disruptions. So we're going to have the balance of power is going to have essentially a cycle of equilibrium and disruption. 
And that's how you explain war, that's how you explain uh, all, all of the sort of dysfunctions in the international system, and it's how you explain peace, prosperity, and stability, is by reference to the way that these different uh, states, their alliances, the, uh, the number of superpowers, uh, so that, that, and that's referred to as polarity. If it's a bipolar world, there are two major superpowers, and alliances sort of uh, form around those two major superpowers. If it's a multipolar world, there are three or more superpowers, and alliances are more fluid and more complex. If it's a unipolar world, there's a single global hegemon, and uh, uh, alliances kind of uh, form you know, as both uh, sheltered by that and then kind of outside that system. Again, this is not a class in international relations, and so I don't need to go into all of this stuff. I have a feeling that many of you have taken these classes, and if not, then, and you're fascinated by this, well then, that's where you can go. Um, the uh, basic concept of realism is that this is the way it is, and therefore it's the way it should be. If you're, if you're a national leader and you don't embrace this should, then one, you're going to be hurting your own nation. If, you're gonna, if you act cooperatively, if you act as though other nation states, when they, when they form agreements, are doing so with anything other than the most self-serving interests, and that as soon as the, those agreements no longer serve them, they're gonna adhere to them, then you're a fool, and your nation is going to suffer. Part of maximizing your power is actually adhering to the realist precepts for diplomacy. Um, and uh, Hans Morgenthau, in his uh, uh, classic work, oh, God, what is it called? Um, something, Politics Among Nations. Po uh, I'm a terrible political science professor for not knowing Morgenthau's uh, uh, title. Um, but uh, he basically, he analyzes the system, but then he also gives advice to po foreign policymakers to sh show them how to maximize uh, power, because in his view, when nation states don't, that creates a dysfunction in the system. Right? Uh, so all nation states will have a tendency to move in that direction. For one thing, if you don't embrace the realist should, that's going to hurt your nation and as a leader you're going to be ousted and other people who are, are going to come in who are actually, if they don't embrace realism, then they're not going to succeed and it's an evolutionary system that will eventually select for people who are, who are doing this. So this, this is, in a way, the realist view is this is a self-enforcing should. So it really kind of is an is. Like, it's an anarchy system among uh, nation states, and the should is advice, but the system will have a tendency to push nations into embracing the should as though it were just the natural way of doing things. And the biggest point here is that there's no escape from this state of nature. And uh, this is because nations are not the kind of vulnerable individuals that Locke and Hobbes uh, posited in the state of nature. Nations don't have the same structure of incentive to rationally create a power above themselves that will solve the problems of the state of nature. Uh, um, and, and so that step is not available. Right? There are plenty of realists who accept the liberal domestic liberal notion that it totally makes sense to leave the anarchic competition among individuals and form a higher power. And in fact, most realists would just say that's, you know, whatever the government looks like, it, it is a solution to the problem of the state of nature and it just exists, right? People don't, you won't have to tell some hypothetical story about rational agents in a state of nature. It happens. And the reason why nations stay with governments is because individuals know that it works for them. Um, there's returning to the state of nature is, is it's not a choice generally, and it's also not a benefit. Nations, however, uh, face a different landscape, and they don't benefit from trying to leave the state of nature uh, in, in the international system, um, and uh, they don't have an incentive to try to seek a, some kind of higher power. In fact, they have all kinds of incentives not to. Why would you want to establish a global government? Well, if you can fool other states, if you can maximize your power by fooling other states to kind of contribute resources to this and abide by the rules and norms, and you don't, and you're gonna be sort of totally amoral about it and, and, and uh, um, self-serving, then it would be great if other nations kicked into this thing and then you abided by it when it served your nation and you didn't when it didn't serve your nation. Um, and 
that you know leaders know this, right? Uh, savvy leaders, and again, if leaders aren't savvy, if they don't follow the realist maxim for uh, uh, conducting their nation's diplomacy, their nation is going to suffer and they're going to be ousted in some way or another. So there's any kind of movement away from an anarchic international system is going to have no momentum or it's gonna be completely duplicitous and uh, it's going to, perhaps if it's implemented, it's gonna serve as a tool of domination. And since the nation states that are losing out in this competition, they're minimizing their power, reducing their power by uh, adhering to this global government or international institution, they're gonna stop doing that. So to, to realist, this is just the way it is. And the, the, I, the, the name of it, realism, this is just reality, right? This, it, it's totally explanatory and any of the normative claims are really more advice than they are kind of a normative argument. It's essentially a don't act this way at your peril, not a you should be doing this. There's a should, but it's really, it's, 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 it's a lighter should in, in terms of, uh, it's not as morally heavy. Uh, like, you know, uh, Kant, you should treat other individuals with respect for their uh, individual sovereignty. That's a pretty heavy should because there aren't really built-in incentives not to. Uh, whereas in the international system, there are built-in incentives to not straying from this particular maxim. Now, liberal internationalism arrives as a critique and an alternative. So that's uh, two realism. So we have a critique and uh, the alternative. Liberalism itself wasn't a critique of conservatism. Uh, conservatism arises afterwards. Or liberalism was not a critique of socialism. Socialism arrives uh, afterwards. Um, but realism predates liberal internationalism. It was the dominant theory of international affairs for a really long time. Um, and in fact, it was so dominant, it didn't even really have adherents. Oh, uh, excuse me, it didn't, it didn't have theorists and philosophers. It had plenty of adherents. It had plenty of people who were behaving. And later realists, the ones who then named the system and, and, and developed the theoretical tools to uh, explain it, um, looked back and said, well, these people were just being realists. This is, this is the way we know the system uh, had this kind of nature is because we look at history and that is how uh, leaders have behaved. So, but the critique, there's a, there's a twofold critique. Um, the critique is one, that it doesn't produce the kind of stability uh, and it's dangerous. So it is not long-term stability. The disruptions can come at any point. The disruptions are going to occur, maybe not predictably, but regularly and frequently. And so there really isn't a balance of power. What there is is a fluctuation between a, an equilibrium where there is a balance and a disequilibrium where there's an imbalance of power. And uh, peace, prosperity, and stability are essentially very contingent, right? It's not a long-term stability. The big three, I'm just going to put stability, is highly contingent. And that's really no way to live. Um, the analogy of the state of nature is apt, but the denial by realists that nation states can analyze and behave in relation to the problems of the state of nature uh, differently than individuals would is denied, right? So, so partly what we have here is that the alternative is that nation states can leave the state of nature. That's the alternative proposition. And that's the part of the critique is they actually have an incentive to do so because their stability is contingent and there's not long-term stability. Nation states themselves are interested in long-term stability. Their, 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 their citizens are interested in long-term stability. So embracing realism is essentially embracing the you know, constant reappearance of war and economic uh, disruption. It's embracing the fact that there's going to be periods of equilibrium followed by uh, disequilibrium. It's accepting that the problems of the state of nature that war and economic disruptions occur pretty frequently are uh, just given in the nature of the universe. And liberals say, no, it is not given in, in, in the nature of the universe. Um, the other critique of this um, is that uh, it ignores 
the kinds of cooperation that do actually evolve in the international system. The realist would look at any kind of uh, international institution or any kind of alliance system uh, or any kind of uh, either formal or informal cooperation among nation states as essentially just a ruse for self-interested power maximizing uh, international actors to get what they want. And that, it, that it's really all just, if it seems cooperative, that's just, uh, essentially it's just BS. Liberals would say, no, look, there are, nations are actually, they are capable of being rational in the same way that uh, individuals are. And since individuals can see that there are solutions to endemic problems in the anarchic state of nature, and those solutions involve cooperation to create a higher power of some kind, there's no reason why nation states, which are being rational, I mean, that's part of the realist, realist view, is that it ignores examples of cooperation that are rational. I'll put that up here, rational cooperation. The, again, there's a, it, among realists, there's a denial that the rationality of adhering to some kind of government entity uh, is scalable to the next level. Liberals say it's scalable. Why wouldn't it be scalable? Um, nation states are e not just collections of individuals who themselves are instrumentally rational, but uh, they are, even according to the principles of realism uh, itself, they are instrumentally rational. Realists are just saying, well, instrumental rationality at the nation state level never involves cooperation, real cooperation, real turning over of, of uh, uh, power to some higher entity. <clears throat> and liberals say, well, you're, that's, that's actually just a, uh, that's a preconceived notion, and anytime you see any kind of international cooperation, of course you're going to see it as self-serving and not as actually cooperative. It's like the person who says that we're all basically selfish, even when you give money to some homeless person, it's just, you're only doing it because it makes you feel good, you're not doing it out of any kind of real altruistic impulse. Um, it's the same kind of thing, no matter, there's no counterexample for it. And so part of the liberal critique of realism is that there's no counterexamples, and that, doesn't, that means it's not a scientific theory. There's no way to disprove it. Um, and you're ignoring the two things. One, nation states are going to act rationally, and it will not always, but in some circumstances, it will be a rational decision to create some kind of entity that's, a, that's above you. Maybe not a global government, right? But that doesn't mean that there are no examples, no opportunities of creating some kind of higher power that has real rulemaking uh, and rule enforcing capabilities. Um, so that's part of the critique. Now the alternative for uh, liberals is international institutions. Analogous to any kind of protection agency that is created by individuals in the state of nature. Here, actually, the, and the interesting thing about this is the state of nature for individuals is always hypothetical. Right? We never have lived in a state of nature with relation to each other. The state of nature is a real thing. It's a real place for nation states. Um, and uh, the, we can see in history and you know, liberal nationalists don't deny that realists were right that for a large chunk of uh, human history, uh, particularly in the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century, that there really was an anarchic international system of competing nation states seeking to maximize their power. So we actually have a real life example of the state of nature. The state of nature is not a hypothetical, it's not a heuristic device, it's not some kind of uh, um, ra story of uh, abstractly rational nation states making cooperation. It's a real process that we can actually see, right? And one of the, so the alternative is that there are nation states in an anarchic situation, they look at the possibility of creating international institutions. They look at a war-torn, economically devastated world after World War I, and then again after World War II, and look and say, well, you know, both of these are at least partly, if not entirely, a result of the balance of power gone into a stage of disruption, there's something to do about this. Um, 
After World War I, the League of Nations and a set of other international uh, forms of international cooperation were supposed to fill that role. It was a failure, right? That was an attempt to get out of the state of nature, and it didn't, and it failed. Uh, and World War II was, in a lot of ways, a result of the failure to create an international regime after World War I provided an example of a catastrophic disruption of the balance of power. And on the second try, international institutions were established. Nation states were rational enough to look at the world and say, these are two very uh, proximate disruptions. Like They happened within a generation of each other. They were hugely disruptive, both in terms of uh, violence and in terms of economic de devastation. There's something to do about this, right? Now, so this is, in fact, a, an expl explanation where liberal internationals are looking at what happened after World War II and the creation of the United Nations, the creation of the International Monetary Fund, the creation of the World Bank, um, the beginning of movement towards uh, a what would later become the, uh, the World Trade Organization, the creation of uh, alliance uh, alliances, uh, NATO and the Eastern Bloc, even though the, a uh, realist would look at that and say, well, that's just examples of, of a bipolar world uh, creating a balance of power with an alliance system, but liberal nationalists would say, no, those were actually regional forms of cooperation. They weren't just uh, self-interested nation states that were kind of faking being together. It was a real form of cooperation. It was serving a regional problem, not a global problem, but it was still an instance of cooperation. So that's the explanatory side. And then the normative side is that this is good. This is what should be done. This is the kind of world that we want to live in. We should build and maintain and reverence the liberal international order. Now, the liberal international order has some pieces of it that are in addition to international institutions. International institutions are not a global government. They don't have to be a global government. Um, one government reigning over the entire world in the way that a, a, a domestic government reigns over the entire territory that a population lives in. Um, international institutions only need to be uh, cooperative schemes among nation states that serve their collective rational interests. Um, this is a solution to this cycle. The idea being that what these international institutions bring is they bring long-term stability as opposed to contingent stability. So this is contingent stability from the point of view of, I won't sell you this, but from the point of view of the critique. So international institutions bring real long-term stability. Conflicts are going to arise between nation states. Liberal internationals are not sort of naive optimists to say, oh, well, once these international institutions are created, uh, then there's not going to be conflict anymore. Just like it would be naive to say, well, now that there's a government, instead of the state of nature, there's not going to be conflict among uh, individuals. Of course there's conflict. The reason uh, why the government is created is because you cannot eliminate conflict in human affairs. You can't limit, eliminate conflict in uh, uh, international affairs either, but what you can do is you can create an arena in which that conflict is solved diplomatically, peacefully, cooperatively, instead of with trade wars or fighting wars, uh, which is what we get with the when the balance of power goes into uh, disruption. We get trade wars, we get uh, colonization, we get uh, like actual attacks on you know, piracy and uh, um, blockades and we get fighting wars between nations. These, th that's a predictable outcome of a uh, realist world. Um, just like uh, the, it's a predictable outcome of a fully free market capitalist system that there's going to be cycles of boom and bust, that there's going to be economic disruption built into an unregulated system. So the international institutions are there to pr they provide long-term instability by promoting peaceful diplomatic cooperation as opposed to, well, when the balance of power and when the equilibrium breaks down because one state gets too weak and therefore is preyed on by another, another state gets too powerful and therefore decides to break all agreements and attack others, uh, then there's, a, there's an automatic disruption. And of course that's going to happen. Nations are rising and falling in relative power all the time, which is totally predictable uh, in any circumstance. And if you have a realist international system, it's going to produce these frequent disruptions. So this will provide long-term uh, stability. The, there is, however, uh, it, from the developed liberal internationalist uh, view, 
it, international institutions themselves are insufficient to provide the kind of full long-term stability that is available in the international system. There are essentially two other legs to the triangle and, and, uh, or to the stool, right? It's, it's a triangle. International institutions, democratic political systems, and free market capitalism. And capitalism that is sufficiently regulated so that it doesn't itself suffer from the laissez-faire boom and bust cycle. So not uh, state socialism, not heavy regulation, not state participation at a high level, but capitalism that is regulated uh, so that uh, it has its irrationalities uh, filed off and it, it can provide for economic stability. So what we get here is democracy gives us domestic political stability. It also gives us, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely threatening to run off the edge of the bottom of the board here, but I'll, I'll deal with it with a picture if, if necessary. It also produces the habit of peaceful resolution of conflict. Getting sideways here, getting a little diagonal. Um, in a democracy, that's what a democracy is. Uh, and that's what's, you know, the liberal model is, political liberalism, is that there are going to be conflicts, all kinds of them. Um, disputes over property, uh, disputes over uh, where the harm principle goes, disputes over uh, c collective action, how it should be uh, carried out, uh, taxation, who bears the burdens of, uh, of uh, the necessary collective endeavors of society. There's going to be conflict all the time. In a democracy, that conflict is consistently ironed out through peaceful, cooperative means. Uh, and a regime of uh, rules, practices, and institutions that promotes that kind of ongoing uh, uh, conflict resolution in a way where we don't just get a breakdown and we get tribal warlords and we get uh, civil wars and, and, and coups all the time. Those do happen, but the, in, a, in a mature democracy, one that actually does promote this in a real way, you get real long-term uh, domestic stability. And that is not only important for upholding the international institutions. You can't have uh, participants in international institutions that are themselves unstable. If there's ch fat, rapid changes in leadership, um, if there's uh, rapid changes in perspective, that's going to be disruptive. With elections, the actual leaders will be different, and so the people who get sent to uh, the international institutions, who get sent to the World Bank and the United Nations and the World Trade Organization and all these, and, and, and NATO, will be different people. But they will all have that same habit of peaceful resolution of conflict, and they will not have extremist ideologies. They might vary, you know, in the United States, our uh, ambassador to the United Nations is either a Republican appointee or a Democratic appointee, and there are different uh, um, perspectives on foreign policy, different perspectives on what, how we should be participating in a cooperating international system. But um, they, the, both Democrats and Republicans are, are, are similar enough in kind of their overall orientation that it promotes, it helps promote that stability. If you have a frequent turnover in leadership and you have kind of tumultuous uh, cycles of revolution and crackdown and coups, then the, and you have a lot of nations that are doing that, international institutions are going to break down. So the liberal internationals are not claiming that as soon as you create international institutions, you're all good. Again, it's, it's a three-legged stool and they, they help reinforce each other. The way that international institutions help to, to uh, um, support democracy is that it's way easier to maintain a system of peaceful resolution of conflict domestically when you have a stable economy, when you have prosperity, and when you have peace. Right? Nothing produces disruptions in a democracy so much as severe economic disruptions. Uh, a t uh, military attacks from outside and just kind of the, the you know instability, regional instability. Um, it really, it, when you look at the world, when you look at places where democracy has the most difficulty taking root, it's because those conditions are absent. Um, so international institutions, by helping to promote that, these are all self-reinforcing. I'm actually going to draw, draw the arrows up here of the Kantian triangle, as it's talked about 
in the reading, these all mutually reinforce each other. The stability, that the international stability that, that helps promote peaceful dem uh, domestic resolution of, of conflict is essential. Now what capitalism provides is capitalism provides regulated capital. I'm going to put regulated capitalism because I think that's an important thing. Part of the thing that's tricky among liberal internationalists is how much regulation of capitalism is acceptable. And this is essentially the same exact debate that occurs within economic liberals, right? This is the, this is the political liberal uh, leg of the triangle. This is the economic liberal leg of the triangle. So there will be differences uh, among liberal internationalists as to like, how much does the government do to make sure capitalism, capitalism stays sane and, and that fr uh, free exchange stays free. But all liberal internationalists accept the idea that accumulation of capital and free exchange uh, as the basis of economic relations is the thing that gives us prosperity. And much like domestic stability uh, comes from democracy and it, it, it is a result of and then produces more peaceful resolution of conflict, what capitalism does is it shows that there are Benefits to mutual exchange. Another lesson, just like peaceful resolution of conflict in a democratic system, another lesson of a, of a capitalist system is that exchange that's voluntary, it can be mutually beneficial, and that reinforces international institutions because if you recognize that uh, peaceful resolution of conflict is beneficial, because that's your political, your domestic political practice, you're gonna seek that in the international arena. If you recognize that exchange, mutual exchange can be uh, mutually, exchange can be mutually beneficial, um, then you're going to, in these international institutions, also recognize that nations can actually benefit from cooperating and exchanging with each other and, tr and, and going into negotiations in the same way that two parties in a capitalist uh, system would go into a negotiation. And presumably, you both benefit from it. Like if I have something that, that I want to sell and you, have, uh, and you want to buy it and we negotiate about the price, ultimately the idea, and this happens, you know, the experience of capitalism shows that it happens maybe not all the time, but an awful lot of the time, then you say, oh, good, negotiating. And it doesn't mean that we're like hugging and being like, oh, I'll give you this and you just give me whatever price you, you, you want. That's not what international cooperation is. That's not what capitalist cooperation is. It's a competitive form of cooperation, but it's one where you can re recognize that there's mutual benefits to that exchange. Um, the benefit that international institutions provide to a capitalist system is, again, by providing that kind of long-term stability so that there aren't economic disruptions. That, it, that International institutions do the same thing for a domestic economy that they do for a domestic political system. They give it the breathing room that's necessary to survive. So the liberal internationalist view is basically that these three components work together and mutually reinforce each other. Um, now, democracy needs to be created. And uh, if you're a political liberal, of course, that's part of your should. That's part of your norm. Like, we should have those. Um, and a capitalist system needs to be created and upheld. Um, neither of these are natural growths in the world. They are products of rational analysis of the problems that face us. In this case, conflict. And in this case, scarcity and unproductivity. And that the same dynamic that leads to the creation of democracy and at least to the creation and maintenance of capitalism will lead to the creation and maintenance of international institutions. So international institutions are really, in a way, an outgrowth of the lessons learned by having a democratic and capitalist system, uh, a, a, a government and economic system. And we can see that that regime has been established. That's, that is what the international regime, for, according to liberal internationalists, uh, not realists, realists have a different interpretation of it, but according to liberal internationalists, that's what the regime, it's not a global government, but it's a regime of interlocking and overlapping international institutions, primarily the United Nations, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the World Trade Organization, all of which are built along lines that adhere to either the principles of democracy or the principles of capitalism or some mixture of the two. Now, again, that doesn't mean 
that there aren't disagreements among liberal internationalists as to what are the right policies to be pursued in the international institutions and what are the right policies to be pushed for in regulated capitalist countries. Um, there are some who, uh, who are much more laissez-faire oriented who believe that capital reg regulated capitalism in a nation doesn't have, it doesn't mean very much in terms of capital controls. So capital uh, investment uh, finance should be freely able to move in and out of nations. And there are other economic liberals who say, no, that's actually too disruptive. The, the, the unregulated flow of capital is potentially disruptive for a, uh, a national economy, and that produces political instability, and that erodes the entire system. So capital controls, uh, while, while not totally controlled, capital uh, controls are uh, legitimate and justified. Um, just like the difference between the two e economic liberals that I talked about last week, uh, Hayek and Friedman, on social insurance schemes. Right? Friedman believes that they are problematic and unnecessary. Hayek believes that they're acceptable and actually even pro provide the kind of economic security that allows for real uh, liberty to flourish. So there will be, within this set, you know, this sort of uh, uh, cousin in the liberal uh, family of ideas, there are also then disagreements ab about how, that, uh, how it should be, like specifically what the policy should be. But there is no disagreement about the fact that, one, real cooperation is possible. Two, only by actual international cooperation are we going to get real long-term stability instead of essentially contingent stability that is, when you have contingent stability, it's essentially instability, right? Even when you have the balance of power, it's always on its way out. Um, you don't know when. But the only way to get long-term stability is with international institutions. and they can't stand on their own. They have to be supported by domestic democracy and by domestic capitalism. Um, so what liberal internationalists are actually asking for is twofold. Um, that at the domestic level, we get liberal institutions. And at the international level, we establish liberal institutions along the lines of cooperation among these liberal uh, members, the liberal nation states. So it's a two, it's a two level argument. Um, realists have nothing to say about what uh, is a necessary form of the nation state. Uh, some realists will actually argue that in order to maximize your power, um, you're better off actually having a democracy. Others will say that's actually the worst way to have uh, a, a system that maximizes your power because it produces changes in leadership and changes in foreign policy orientation that actually don't allow for long-term planning. Uh, so realists will argue among themselves, and there's no theoretical reason to, to, to uh, favor one form of nation state over another. Whereas in liberal internationalism, it's a double level of liberalism. Political and economic liberalism at the domestic level, and then a combination of political and economic liberalism at the international level. Um, and these in international institutions will be uh, themselves, they'll be unusual. They'll be kind of hybrids. They won't look like a government, and they won't look like uh, an economic system. They're, gonna, they're kind of a combination of a governed economic system, and they won't always have the same model of democracy that uh, the member nations have, right? So, for example, the United Nations has two major components. There's the Security Council, and then there's the General Assembly. The General Assembly has a form of democracy where every nation gets uh, one vote. The Security Council gives every member one vote, but not every member of the United Nations is a, is a member. There's rotation among the non-permanent members, and then there are permanent members. And the permanent members are the superpowers that kind of draw on the realist model, like, okay, superpowers are an important part of the international system, and the model of democracy there is that those superpowers have a veto, right? A veto is not an undemocratic, uh, um, Procedure obviously now we have a veto in our democratic system. It's a check on uh, the um, power of the majority. So and checks are all part of a democratic system. There's no argument that whatever democracy looks like at the domestic level, it should look exactly like that at the international level. There is a change when you move from one layer to another, one level to another. Not the change that realists say, which is that at the domestic level you can have cooperation around the government, but at the international level you can't. Uh, there, there's, a, there's not that difference, that's part of the critique, but there is an acceptance that, yeah, international institutions are going to look different than domestic institutions.
Um, in a way, liberal internationalism is kind of the coming of age of the liberal family of ideas. It's, it, it, it's thinking big, it's thinking on a global scale, it's also uh, generalizing the lessons from, a, from political liberalism and economic liberalism to say, well, those things can actually uh, be applied in a different part of the uh, world, in the international system, in relations among nation states, that couldn't be before. And the big claim, and for a lot of the 20th century, this claim seemed to hold up really well. The big claim was that the more democracy we get, the more peace we're going to get. Uh, the democratic peace theory, that democracies don't frequently attack each other, if ever, uh, holds up pretty well. That the more uh, regulated capitalism we get, the more uh, prosperity and uh, um, growth and development we're going to get. And the more international institutions are formed and have experience and create the habit of cooperation between nations uh, themselves, just like democracy promotes the habit of cooperation among uh, essentially warring factions or conflicting factions at the domestic level, the, uh, the stronger uh, those international institutions get and the, the, the more powerful our stability is, the more long-term our stability is. And uh, you know, I think that one of the interesting things is that there are always going to be tests to that stability. There are going to be tests where at the domestic level, policy changes enough that it impacts the behavior of important players in international institutions, right? As the United States becomes more, you know, America first and more uh, economically uh, isolationist and less uh, open to free trade, that puts a strain on the international system. It, it, we are actually at a point right now where our leadership uh, is pursuing a foreign policy that is more economically and politically realist um, in a kind of a strange, not classic way. Uh, the Trump foreign policy is definitely not just a reversion to a Morgan Thau, uh, you know, formula for how to behave on the international uh, uh, stage, but it moves in, in that direction and it is putting some stress. But one of the things that economic, or excuse me, not economic, liberal internationalists would argue is that the weight of the system, the cooperation that has been fostered through decades of international institutions, through the habit of working together, cements that kind of mindset so that even disruptions, even, even, a, even a disruptor like Donald Trump uh, uh, at the head of the foreign policy of arguably the most powerful uh, uh, nation on earth, um, definitely one of the most powerful, that even that uh, disruption is outweighed by the habit of cooperation and the desire of the other participants in the international institutions to uphold the norms and rules of the international regime that was built up after World War II. And that that's one of the reasons why you get real long-term stability, is that there can be policy changes within nations. There can be democratic shifts, there can be economic uh, uh, changes in how regulated or not regulated, how committed to free trade and free exchange uh, member nations are. And yet, much like in a domestic democratic system where there can be changes in the alignments of, of interest groups, there can be shifts in, in parties' ideologies. The habit of solving problems through the democratic system uh, is there so that even though there are groups that hate, start to hate democracy, there's a weight to it. There's, there's precedent, there's behavior and expectations, and there are <coughs> um, institutions that are uh, inhabited by people who adhere to the norms of the international or either the international or the domestic uh, democratic system that are a counterbalance to those forces that are trying to tear it down. Uh, and that a big part of the strength of the liberal international system is the interdependence of the three different aspects of it. That's why you really can't do with that anyway. It would be hard to put together a set of international institutions along liberal lines if all or most of your uh, members were actually authoritarian governments. So, uh, or if there was a mixture of heavy socialism and totally laissez-faire capitalism among uh, the, the member nations, uh, it, would, it would be disruptive. But given that the international institutions were built up around these two things, and that as they grew and uh, um, evolved through the middle and late uh, 20th century, that more and more nations at least had some kind of democracy and, and capitalism became far more common around uh, the world, that that contributed to the strength and that the stability of the liberal international order, even though it's threatened by a global pandemic and even though it's threatened by uh, right-wing nationalist movements in all kinds of core countries like the United States and Greece and Germany uh, <clears throat> and France, 
that the habit of cooperation, the regimes themselves, the power of the, of the free trade uh, uh, viewpoint in the World Trade Organization and in the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund are strong enough and there's enough people who, who have lived with the benefits of this, these norms and behaviors that the system has a kind of strength. Much like the United States government has a kind of strength that even though there's all kinds of different uh, factions in our country that disagree with each other deeply, that there's a, a strength and a stability to our democratic system and to our largely capitalist uh, economic system. So <clears throat> that's the claim, and, and, and I'm sure you can see that this is both a different version of liberalism. It's, it, it's, it's a less close family member, but it is built on the very familiar foundations of political liberalism and economic liberalism that uh, we should know by now. All right, well, that is the first part of the class. That's liberalism in its various facets, in its kind of uh, overlaps as well as uh, slight disagreements. I hope that you have at this point an appreciation for one, the diversity of uh, perspective within, liberal, within liberalism, as well as the different places in the world that liberal ideas can apply. They apply to society, they apply to the political system, they apply to the economy, they apply to international relations. Uh, it really, there's nowhere that liberalism doesn't look that it can't take the liberal ideas. And the liberal ideas are all based on the fact that the sovereign individual and the free choice of sovereign individuals is the primary, central, most important value that needs to be uh, adhered to and advanced. And whatever it takes, and the, there are a lot of differences as to what it takes to adhere to and advance uh, individual sovereignty, um, but that is the commonality. That's what all of them have. That, that's, the, that's the family nose or the family chin in the liberal family of ideas. All right, well, that's it. Uh, starting next week, we're going to look at critiques. And of course, that will bring us back to re-referencing all kinds of liberal ideas. And so it's not as though we're leaving liberalism in the rearview mirror and moving on to a different set of ideas. We're looking at different perspectives on the world in and of themselves, but primarily as, criti as critiques of liberalism. Just like liberalism itself is a critique of realism, we're going to now start looking at critiques that also have a critique of liberalism, and an alternative vision of what the world sh is and mostly should look like. All right, until next week, uh, that's it.